Order number six, notices of motion. Order number seven, questions and statements. Order number eight, special motion, proposed removal by impeachment of His, His Excellency Rigadi Gachagua, EGH, Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Honorable Mwengi Mutuse Ekomas, may I take the floor. Begin, can the majority and minority leaders approach the chair? Honorable members, as we start the motion, a slight variation on my communication. The majority leader and the minority leaders in the House will prefer to speak immediately after the subject of the motion speaks before the mover is called upon to reply. I have acceded to their request and it's so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to move the special motion on the impeachment of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa. Mr. Speaker and Honorable Members, start Mwenge Mutuse by saying, I beg to move the following motion and read the motion as it is on the order paper. What you probably can... Uh, Skip is reading out all the names of the members which you read. Just say this, the members who signed the motion are set out on the order paper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to move, I beg to move the following motion that pursuant to the provisions of Article 145 and Article 151B and 2 of the Constitution and Standing Orders Number 64 and 65, the House resolves to remove from office by impeachment His Excellency Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa, EGH, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya on the following grounds. One, gross violation of Articles 10, 2A, B, and C, Article 27, 4, Article 73, 1A, and, Article, and 2B, Article 75, 1C, Article 29, 2 of the Constitution, and Article 147, 1, as read together with Article 131, 2C and D of the Constitution. That His Excellency, the Deputy President, has persistently made utterances threatening to discriminate, exclude, and unlawfully deny sections of the people of Kenya and regions of the Republic of Kenya 
equal opportunities for public service appointments and allocation of public resources. Ground number two, gross violation of Articles 147.1 and 152.1 of the Constitution by undermining the President and the Cabinet and the effective discharge of national government's executive mandate. That His Excellency the Deputy President has made unilateral statements inconsistent with policy positions collectiv collectively adopted by the government and contradicted the President on critical matters of governance and the exercise of the President's function as a symbol of national unity. Three, gross violation of Articles 6.2, 10.2a, 174, 186.1, 189.1, and the fourth schedule to the Constitution by undermining devolution. That His Excellency the Deputy President interfered with the running of Nairobi City County Government by inciting citizens against lawful directives of the county government on the planning and relocation of markets and publicly disparaging the leadership of the county government and its decisions. Four, gross violation of Article 161 of the Constitution on the institutional and decisional independence of judges. That, His Excellency the Deputy President has undermined the institutional and decisional independence of a judge through public attacks on a judge of the High Court of Kenya and falsely threatening to file a petition for the removal of the judge of the said judge in a matter in which he was a party. Five, gross violation of Article 3.1 and Article 148.5a of the Constitution on the fidelity to the oath of office and allegiance that His Excellency the Deputy President breached his oath of office and allegiance on account of the utterances and actions attributed to the Deputy President under Grounds 1, 2, and 3. Six, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes under Sections 13.1a and 62 of the National Coercion and Integration Act. That His Excellency the Deputy President has persistently made inflammatory, reckless, insightful, public utterances over the last two years in contravention of the law. Seven, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed gross economic crimes under sections 45.1, 46.47a3, and 48.1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act and sections 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Process of Crime and, and Money Laundering Act. That His Excellency the Deputy President has committed gross economic crimes, namely conflict of interest, abuse of office, and conspiracy to commit crimes under sections, under the sections highlighted by in, 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 inexplic inexplicably amassing property estimated at Kenya shillings 5.2 billion, that is incompatible with his non-legitimate income, and by trading with the office of the Deputy President through proxies. Eight, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes by continuously misleading members of the public through force, malicious, divisive, and insightful remarks that are contrary to the provisions of Section 132 of the Penal Code and Section 29 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Nine, gross misconduct that is incompatible with the high calling and dignified status of the office of the Deputy President, a member of the Cabinet, and a member of the National Security Council. His Excellency the Deputy President has publicly attacked and undermined the work of the National Intelligence Service and its officers. Number 10, gross misconduct by openly or publicly insubordinating the president, who is the head of state and government. And number 11, the last ground, gross misconduct by persistently bullying state officers and public officers. Mr. Speaker, the motion is supported by a total of 291 members and is, is contained in the order paper.
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in prosecuting this motion, you, it will be remembered that we gave the notice of motion on Tuesday 1st, 2024, and the House also takes public notice that though and procedurally, the Deputy President did address the nation yesterday, and therefore, part of what he said may form part of what I will be talking about. I will then briefly state the facts constituting the particulars and I will tie it up finally with the evidence supporting our allegations. This will make it easy for members to understand what it is that we are accusing the Deputy President of doing. In the, doing this, Mr. Speaker, I choose to be a prosecutor and I remove my political cap. I will therefore avoid the bravado and machismo that uh, we were, was displayed yesterday on television and we will just talk about the law, the facts, and the evidence. Order, members. Mr. Order. Speaker. Take Mr. your seats, McClub. Mr. Speaker, honorable members and Kenyans at large, if I do not talk about my departed relatives, it is because I do not think it is proper to use departed relatives to weep public emotions. It is because I do not think it is proper to use departed relatives to seek public sympathy. And therefore, much as I have also departed relatives, I will not talk about them. Mr. Speaker, before I begin going count by count, Allow me also to state on two important questions and I want honorable members to listen. Two important things, two things are important. That this is an historical moment and it is also a constitutional moment because Kenya under the 2010 constitution has never dealt with the impeachment of a deputy president. However, we have dealt in numerous times with the impeachment of governors. And our courts of law have set the threshold on which impeachments should be considered. And I thought from the onset, it is important for me to set out the threshold on which impeachments should be considered. So that as I take you through the evidence that we have, you can gauge the evidence against what the courts of law have decided. And Mr. Speaker, allow me to read paragraph 31 of civil appeal number 21 of 2014, famously called the Wambora decision. The Wambora decision is now the, the locus for most of the impeachment cases and has been cited with approval by our Supreme Court. In, in paragraph 31, the court stated as follows. Our reading and the interpretation of Article 181 of the Constitution has read with Section 33 of the County Government Acts, shows that the removal of a governor is the constitutional and political process, underlying constitutional and political process. It is a sui generis process that is quasi-judicial in nature, and rules of natural justice and fair administrative action must be observed. What I'm going to read is the most important part. The impeachment architecture in Article 181 of the Constitution, reviews that the removal of a governor is not about criminality or culpability, but is about accountability, is about political governance, as well as policy and political responsibility. Mr. Speaker, the coaching of Article 181 in the Constitution, which relates to removal of a governor, is similar to the coaching of Article 150, which relates to the removal of a deputy governor. And therefore, mutatis mutandis, the, what the Court of Appeal did state, that the removal of a governor is not about criminal or capability. It is about accountability, political governance, as well as pol policy and political responsibility applies to the removal of a deputy president. Mr. Speaker, 
the standard. I am prepared this, uh, this morning to discharge my burden of proof because EU alleges must also prove. And I am ready to discharge it to the required threshold. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, in consideration of the time that I have been given, allow me now to go to the specific grounds. Ground number one, Mr. Speaker, Ground number one. Briefly. On ground number one, Mr. Speaker, we have alleged that the Deputy President has grossly violated the Constitution and particularly Article 10 to A, Article 10 to B and C, Article 27, Article 73, Article 75, Article 129, Article 147, and Article 131. Mr. Speaker, for clarity, Allow me to read out the specific provisions so that members may relate with what we are saying. Article 10 is about national values and principles of governance. Article 10 to B states as follows. The national values and principles of governance include patriotism, national unity, important national unity, sharing and devolution of power, the rule of law, democracy, and participation of the people. B, human dignity, equality, social justice, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. Underline the words national unity and inclusiveness. C, good governance, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Mr. Speaker, we have also alleged that the Deputy President has breached Article 27 of the Constitution. Article 27 of the Constitution is about equality and freedom from discrimination. In particular, the articles, Article 27 four states as follows. The state shall not discriminate directly or indirectly against any person on any ground, including, on any ground, including race, sex, pregnancy, marital status, and so forth, and so forth. Important, the state shall not discriminate. Mr. Speaker, we have also alleged that the Deputy President has breached Article 73.1 of the Constitution. In particular, Article 73.1 is on leadership and integrity, and it speaks to the authority that is assigned to a, to a state officer. And it states as follows, Article 73, 1A, that the authority assigned to a state officer is a, public, is a public trust to be exercised in a manner that is consistent with the purposes and objects of this Constitution. Article 73, 2B, states that the guiding principles of leadership and integrity include objectivity, and impartiality, objectivity and impartiality in decision making and in ensuring that decisions are not influenced by nepotism, favorism, underlying favorism, or other improper motives or corrupt practices. Mr. Speaker, we can go on and on to demonstrate in Article 75. Under Article 75.1c, that the contact of a state officer, a state officer shall behave, whether in public and official life, in private life, or in association with other persons, in a manner that avoids C, demeaning the office that the officer holds. Mr. Speaker, I am taking time on this one because it is important to demonstrate 
that the Deputy President has not lived up to the high calling of the office that he owes and thus has violated, the, has violated the Constitution. Article 129 is about the principles of executive authority. And particularly, we have said that the Deputy President has breached Article 129.2. Article 129.2 states that the executive authority shall be exercised in a manner that is compatible with the principles of service to the people of Kenya and for their well-being and benefits. We have also alleged that the Deputy President has breached Article 147 in conclusion on this particular ground. And Article 147 provides is about the functions of the Deputy President. And the Deputy, it provides that the Deputy President shall be the principal assistant to the President and shall deputize, the pres shall deputize for the President in the executions of the President's functions. Article 131 is the one that provides for the authority of the President. And under 131.2, it provides as follows, that the President shall a, respect, uphold, and safeguard the Constitution. And C, promote and enhance the unity of the nation. Promote and enhance the unity of the nation. Mr. Speaker, it is, it is our allegation that on numerous occasions in the last two years, the De Deputy President has used divisive language. He has described the Kenya government as a company. He has described the Kenya government as a shareholding company, where it is only the shareholders of the company who should benefit. And it is our contestation that that particular shareholding language contradicts and contravenes and violates all the provisions of the Constitution that I have highlighted above. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Constitution does require even as the preamble recognizes that Kenya is a multi-ethnic society. We have about 44, I think 45 ethnic groups in this country, big and small. And all of them are recognized by our Constitution and all of them need to enjoy their equal rights. And the Deputy President has consistently told Kenyans in several places of this country that some will benefit from government and others will not benefit from government. Mr. Speaker, I need not waste a lot of time prosecuting this point because those of you who listened to the Deputy President yesterday, he, read, he did admit that he has been using the shareholder and company language against Kenyans. Since the only thing that he did, and when, when there is an admission by the accused person, the prosecution does not need to prove a point. To find that this allegation is proved, and to find that the Deputy President indeed did admit that uh, he has been using the shareholder language, only that for the first time, and this is important, Mr. Speaker, for the first time, the Deputy President did, while admitting, he said that he has been referring to the shareholder company language in reference to coalition agreements. The evidence that I'm going to present shortly will demonstrate that he has never, in his utterances in the last two years, talked about coalition agreements or power sharing deals that were signed before the election among the Kenya Kwanzaa political Formation. He has been talking directly to communities. He went to Kajiado. He told the people of Kajiado that they do not have shares. He went to Kitui during a church service at AIC Kitui and he told the people of Ukambani that they should not even have, be having a cabinet minister in government. He went to Bungoma and told the people of Bungoma that they have had too many appointments in government and the votes they brought are not equivalent to the votes they brought. He went to Nandi and told the people of Nandi that they are a major shareholder and they will benefit more than others in this government. And he has been using the language in direct reference to communities, not to political party formations. Mr. Speaker, 
without belaboring this point, without belaboring this point, allow me now, allow me now to request that the evidence on ethnic profiling and divisive shareholder politics as contained in video one and video four be played for the house to take note of the evidence. Order members, we did the, the, the technicians who are playing, I can't request that you repeat, you repeat and you play it with a higher, with, on a higher volume. Please, please post, please post it, and I also request Mr. Speaker, you direct that during the time that we are playing our clips, our time be paused. Please, please repeat so that members may appreciate and also Kenyans may know that we are not, we are not persecuting. We are not persecuting. Kali, ni kampuni. Na ni ashears. Senior, ni ashears. Kuna wanya kampuni, wale wako na shears mingi, kuna wale wako na chache, kuna wale hawana. Sasa nyinyi, muli investi kwa hii kampuni ya William Ruto na Regadi Kashagwa. Sasa lazima, Mbufune, yule ambaye alipanda, atafanya nini? Simulipanda? Simuliamuka mapema? Muka zema mutaki kusikia mambo ya ile system na nini? Muka invest, muka panda, muka palilia, muka weka mpolea, muka mwagilia maji, wakati ya kubuna diyo huu. Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Na hiyo ya gina wana nikachifu wati mimi nasema, ati wale wali panda wavune kwanza. Hiko makosa? Hiko makosa? Hata hao watavuna lakini wangoje. Si wale walipanda na wafuna kwanza. Wakishavu na wafuna, 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 ile tabaki kidogo. Wale waku panda waingie, watavute huko, nini hile tapatikana wachukue, wakwene. Si hiko na muna hiyo? Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Diyo watu wakipika kura waelewe hii kura tukusema nini? Hii kura hiko na maana. Nini ya muwezi pika kelele huko mpike kelele? Muna sema wija mtu ni pure? Awezi, muna hita ya majina, alamu wa kipata, wa kigawa, muna pika laini ya tibuko pale mbele. Ati muna taka mpite wale wali sema anafaa, ati bukue pale mbele. Ita waiza kana? Mimi kazi yangu pale kwa ikulu ni hiyo. Ni kubanga hiyo laini. Hapo, ni kazi mimi na banga hapo. Mimi na angalia kwa laini, ni kiona we ulipanda, na putawe nyuma, na peleka we mbele. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of time, I have 14 other videos that have been that the deputy president is recorded speaking in different parts of the country, same same language, saying that Kenya is a, is a company, and a company is belongs to shareholders. It is clear from the clip. I am not the one. I am not the one who made that clip. The person talking in the clip is none other than the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, the office of the De Deputy President is a national office. The territory of the Republic of Kenya is defined in the Constitution. The territory of the Republic of Kenya is known. The ethnic communities of the Republic of Kenya are all supposed to enjoy benefits from the government. And therefore, I am, invi I'm inviting, I am inviting members of this assembly to find that the Deputy President has breached all the articles of the Constitution as contained in this ground. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it is no gain saying that divisive ethnic politics are dangerous. You need not look further than the country of Yugoslavia. What ethnic politics did to the country of Yugoslavia? You need not look further than the country of Bosnia. What ethnic politics did to the country of Bosnia? You need not look further than the country of Rwanda. What ethnic politics did to Rwanda? You need not look further than the country of Burundi. What ethnic politics did to the country of Burundi? Until today, they are trying to reconfigure their state. You need not look further than Sudan. What ethnic politics have done to the good Republic of Sudan that was once a stable state? You need not look even further than the country of Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, Ethiopia. Mr. Speaker, our own country, Kenya. 2007, we experienced post-election violence. You would remember that in 1992 there were clashes in Molo. 
And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, character is important in evidence. The Deputy President, there is evidence to show that during the post-election clashes in Molo, he was a district officer in Molo. Character, character, character is very important in deciding evidence and in persuasion. Mr. Speaker, in 1992 there were clashes in Likoni and our tourism has never recovered. Mr. Speaker, we need not go that direction again. And a person occupying the high office of the Deputy President, if they want to take Kenya in that direction, the time has come for the National Assembly to stand on its feet to defend the Constitution and to impeach the Deputy President. So that even if on, not on any other ground, for purposes of dividing Kenya, the Deputy President today must be impeached. Yes, Mr. Speaker, allow me to turn to my ground two. Mr. Speaker, on ground two, I am alleging that the Deputy President has violated Article 147.1 of the Constitution and has also violated Article 152.1 of the Constitution. Because all of us are not lawyers, please allow me, for purposes of clarity, to read those two articles for members to appreciate. Article 147 of the Constitution does state as follows. Functions of the Deputy President. The Deputy President shall be the principal assistant to the President and shall deputize for the President in the execution of the President's functions. Article 152.1 states as follows. Composition, the Cabinet consists of the, of the following. One, the President. Two, the Deputy President. The person I am pleading to the House today to impeach is a member of Cabinet. C, the Attorney General. And D, not fewer than 14 and not more than 21 Cabinet Secretaries. Mr. Speaker, the importance of this is to show that the Deputy President is assigned to assist the President and is a member of the Cabinet. And what we are demonstrating, Mr. Speaker, because of time, is that the Cabinet has been making decisions, the Deputy President sitting in Cabinet, Cabinet members come before Cabinet, they are discussed in Cabinet, and then the Deputy President moves out of Cabinet to contradict those decisions. In proving this, I, will, I am relying on the affidavit of Masi Wanjau. Masi Wanjau is the Secretary to the Cabinet. And in our affidavit that is in my band of documents, at page 77 to 79, Masi Wanjau does in oath state that the Cabinet made a decision to rejuvenate Nairobi River. And when that decision was made because it is, the law requires that settlement be 30 meters away from a river, the Deputy President was sitting in Cabinet. The Deputy President is actually the You need to live by that decision. During his televised interview yesterday, the Deputy President said that he's the most compassionate person. He cares so much about the poor. This afternoon, honorable members of par Parliament, I want to ask the following question, and if I may be heard in silence. The Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya is on record as being the person who ordered demolitions in Mavoko constituency in Adriva. river. Yes, yes. Yesterday, he gave half truths to Kenyans, saying he opposed this cabinet decision because it was unconstitutional, because he's very compassionate about Kenyans. Why didn't he also go ahead to say that he's also the one who led demolitions in Mavoko constituency? Are the people of Mavoko constituency lesser citizens of this republic? 
Or is it because in his own thinking, they are not shareholders of this republic? And therefore, I'll be pleading with honorable members to find that the deputy president has breached the particular articles of the constitution by being averse to the doctrine of collective responsibility and by contradicting the president and cabinet decisions. Quickly to, to ground three. Mr. Speaker, ground three. Tango mutupatia rafazi ya uongozi, sija pata rafazi ya kuja kusema asanti. Nataka kutoka kwa wangu dani, watu ya kayone asante ni sana. Mimi najua, ni miona hiko shida ya watu, ambaye walibomolewa. Sindio? Na ni miona mumeandika habizuri, Ya kwamba muteue kamati ya watu wachache Dio mukuje niketi na nyinyi Mutakubaliana Mimi ningetaka Wale watu ambaye walipata shida Hii ya upomo waji Abaye ni kitu tulikuwa tumeaidi wanainji haitafanyika kwa serikali yetu Mimi ningetaka di wasikize Na nitapanga na mweshimu wa mejadong Wakuje diyo tukue na nafasi ya kuongea Tumekubaliana 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 Mr. Speaker That is beyond the affidavit of Masi Wanjao Which is on record That is a live video Depicting the Deputy President contradicting a cabinet decision A decision which is sat in cabinet In terms of making the decision I now proceed to ground number three because of time. Under ground number three, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy President has breached Article 62 of the Constitution, Article 10.2 of the Constitution, Article 174 of the Constitution, Article 186 of the Constitution, and Article 189 of the Constitution. Briefly, these articles relate to the functions of county governments and the cooperation with which the cooperation framework between the national and county government. And uh, Mr. Speaker, then we are relying to prove this ground on the affidavit of His Excellency Johnson Sakaja, the governor of Nairobi, which in our bundle of documents is contained on page 80 to 84 of my motion. We, are also rely, we will also later rely on the oral testimony of Governor Sakaja. And basically what we are saying is that the work of regulating markets is an exclusive function of county governments. And the county government of Nairobi is, an, is a government that is independent, but also independent of the national government. And where a function of a county government is independent of the other arm of government, the national government has no mandate at all to interfere in the execution of that document. And in the affidavit of Sakaja's members would know Sakaja does state on oath that the county government of Nairobi made a decision to relocate traders from CBD and the deputy president recklessly and without regard to the high office that he holds went to incite people to obey lawful decisions of the county government of Nairobi, hence undermining devolution. Mr. Speaker, we invite members to find that the Deputy President did breach and violate the Constitution in terms of undermining devolution and in terms of interfering with the running of the city county of Nairobi. Mr. Speaker, allow me now to move to ground number four. Ground number four is about intimidation and vilification of judges which is contrary to Article 160 of the Constitution. Article 160 of the Constitution speaks to the independence of the judiciary. Mr. Speaker, at, in our bundle of documents, at page 145 to 163, we have attached the decision of Lady Justice Esther Minor, where the Lady Justice Esther Minor found that 200 million shillings assets of His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa were proceeds of crime 
and directed that the same be forfeited to the state. In, ex in, in, in intimidating the judge, the deputy president, in a public statement, accused the judge of corruption and did state that he will file a petition for the removal of the judge solely, solely because the judge found him culpable of crime of, 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 of economic crimes. Mr. Speaker, you see, in terms of rule of law, Parliament makes laws. The judiciary interprets those laws and makes decisions. Members of Parliament must ask themselves what kind of a country we shall have if, if a, 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 a judge makes a decision that does not favor me, then I, I, I will resort to personal vendetta against that particular judge. Mr. Speaker, I will be playing shortly a clip where the Deputy President did threaten to occasion the removal of Justice Esther Maina on ground of our finding that she he was culpable of money laundering. I request the media team to play the clip in evidence. Shall we are now filing a petition to push. Now we begin the bulletin with the war on the judiciary, where Kenya Kwanzaa administration is making good on its threat. With the Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa now filing a petition to push for the removal of a judge from office. Gashagwa says he will on Thursday file a petition with the Judicial Service Commission to push for the removal of Justice Esther Mina, who handled an economic crimes case against him in 2022 for alleged corruption and misconduct. Now, speaking in Iten, where he accompanied President William Ruto for a church service, Gashagwa told the Chief Justice to first clean up her house by dealing with pending cases with the Judicial Service Commission. Now, in the sustained onslaught against the judiciary, President William Ruto vowed to deal with unnamed government officers he described as incompetent saying his administration will slay the corruption monster that has reared its ugly head in various arms of government. Chamatai Goen reports. After Chief Justice Martha Kome invited Kenyans with complaints over the conduct of judicial officers to submit their lamentations to her office, the Kenya Kwanzaa administration, through Deputy President Rigadi Gashagwa, has taken the challenge, with the DUP announcing that he will file a petition this week. And the challenge is easy to throw a Mushahidi. I will lead by example. On Thursday, this coming week, at 2.15, I will personally present a petition before Lady Chief Justice Mother Kome against Justice Esther Maina for her removal from the judiciary for misconduct and corruption. Because Gashago relieving his July 2022 incident where 202 million shillings was seized to the state after Justice Esther Minor ruled the money was proceeds of corruption having been acquired through dubious means. Who your judge through corruption declared my hard and worth wealth proceeds of crime without giving me an opportunity to be heard. Again is the rules of evidence where he who alleges must prove. We made an application to cross-examine the investigator Akakata. Kwasababu anajua there is no case. Na evidence to Konayo Vile Rifanyika. The Kenya Kwanzaa Battalion. Mr. Speaker, I will request Kome that we pause the video in the interest of time. In the interest of time, we pause the video. From the utterances, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the attack on the judge is based on the decision the judge made in performing our constitutional mandate as a judge. It is clear that this is personal vendetta. It is clear that the deputy president was threatening the judge. It is clear that this is intimidation and an attack on the independence of the judiciary. 
Mr. Speaker, the Deputy President is the President in waiting. And if he cannot, he's the President in waiting. And if he cannot protect and uphold the independence of the judiciary, that becomes a dangerous man. And he must be impeached for that particular reason. Mr. Speaker, I will therefore be requesting members of this House to find that this allegation has been proved to the required standard and approve the impeachment of the Gathi Gashagwa from the office of Deputy President. On ground number five, we have alleged that the Pre Deputy President has breached Article 3.1 of the Constitution, Article 148.5 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, Article 3.1 of the Constitution is about adherence to the Constitution. It states for avoidance of doubt as follows, that every person has an obligation to respect, uphold, and defend this Constitution. Article 148.5 is about the oath of allegiance that the Deputy President took on assumption of office. And in that oath, the Deputy President did take oath and swore to protect and uphold the Constitution. I have demonstrated in all the particular incidences above that he has not lived up to the calling in the oath of office. And therefore, I'm calling this House to find that the, president, the Deputy President has not been upheld in the Constitution and has run averse to his oath of office in terms of his conduct as highlighted above in the allegations that I have already proven. And for that reason, Mr. Speaker, to find that ground number five is also proven. Quickly, running to ground number six, and there is enough evidence, Mr. Speaker, to prove that particular ground. Ground number six is breach of the National Cohesion and Integration Act, particularly section 13, 1, and 62 of the National Integration and Cohesion Act. Mr. Speaker, the two provisions read as follows. Section 13 reads as follows. It is an offense for any person to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior where the person intends to stir feelings of ethnic contempt, hostility, violence, or discrimination. Section 62 on the other side provides as follows, that a person commits an offense when the person makes statements that are intended or are likely to stir up feelings of ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. Mr. Speaker, in proving ground number one, in terms of violation of the Constitution on national unity, I did provide evidence that the Deputy President has been using the shareholder language has been terming the Kenya government as a company. And as much as those words offend the Constitution, similarly, they offend the National Cohesion and Integration Act. And by the same evidence, I invite members to find that the Deputy President has breached those provisions of the law. Mr. Speaker, turning now to ground number seven. Ground number seven, and this is important for members to know, is that serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagua. The ground is about serious reasons to believe. So you all, all you need is to believe. All you need is to believe that he has committed crimes. All you need in law is to believe that Rigadi Gashagua has committed crimes. That is the threshold. If in your mind you believe that Rigadi Gashagwa, by the narration that I'm going to give, has committed crimes, then you vote in the affirmative. Serious reasons to believe that Rigadi Gashagwa has committed crimes under sections 45, 1A46 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, and sections 2, 3, 4, 7 of the Process of Crime and Money Laundering Act. And Mr. Speaker, 
Our allegation here is that the Deputy President, in the last two years, has amassed wealth that during the short period that I was able to do research, totals to about 5.2 billion, which is inconsistent with his known sources of income and with his last declaration of income. Mr. Speaker, it will be remembered that during the presidential debate, the Deputy President did declare that he was worth 800 million. It is also known by virtue of the gazettements by the Salaries and Remuneration Commission that he earns a million or thereabout per month, and therefore he needs to show where he got the money to amass these properties. The import of my allegation is twofold. Number one, there is what we call unexplained assets under the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. And number two, there is money laundering. Mr. Speaker, in my motion, I have listed a total of 22 companies, 22 companies that I believe the Deputy President has been using, number one, to amass, to award himself through conflict of interest, businesses in his office and in government. And neither of them belongs to him. All he did was to say that he registered some of them before he became deputy president. I am not interested in the time that the companies were, were, were registered. I am interested in what the companies have done in the last two years. And I will demonstrate that, some of, that these companies have actually done economic crimes against the people of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, I have also listed properties. I have listed a number of properties that the deputy president has purchased within the two years that he has been in office. I have listed Treetops Hotel in Nyeri. I have listed Olive Gardens Hotel. I have listed Queensgate Service Apartments. I have listed Wamunyoro Investments Land in Mbakasi. I have listed the Abadea Treetops Hotel, Outspan Hotel, Olive Gardens Hotel, and the Vipingo Beach Resort. Mr. Speaker, you will be told by the defense that some of the properties that I've listed do not belong to Rigadi Gashagwa, but they belong to the estate of Nderitu Gashagwa. Mr. Speaker, as you listen, please know that this man is not fond of telling the truth. And I will prove to you, I will prove to you, and I want you to listen to me very carefully, that Mr. Rigadi Gashagwa, it is true that he was one of the administrators of the estate of his late brother. It is easy to hide under the dead because the dead cannot come to give evidence. But also, there are documents. I have with me the joint will executor's report on the status of the estate of, Rigadi, of, of, of Niritu Gashagwa as the 27th June 2024. This is a valid document that is part of our bundle of documents and that also I have seen is part of the documents that came through public participation. And in this document, what the Deputy President has not told Kenyans, and listen to me, because the Deputy President actually committed another crime yesterday, misleading Kenyans. What the Deputy President has not told Kenyans is that in those two years, he is the one who has bought the properties of his own brother through coercion. And I am not interested, I have no problem with people owning property. What I have a problem with, and this is what he needs to be explaining to us, where did you get the money to buy these properties? This is, the, this is the big question. This is the big question. Mr. Speaker, you will be told that uh, when I became Deputy President, I transferred my companies to my two sons. And my two sons are the best entrepreneurs that Kenya has ever produced. They are the best investors that Kenya has ever produced. And they, one day they walked into a bank and they got a loan of 600 million. Mr. Speaker, I have looked at the ID numbers of the two sons. And I can confirm that they are in their early 30s. I want Kenyans, Gen Z's, you were in the streets. I want Kenyans to tell me which Kenyan, 23 years old, can walk into a bank. Where do you get the security to secure 600 million loan? I started by saying all you need to do 
is to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes and, the reason, and, and buying, if buying properties worth 5.2 billion within a period of two years is not reason enough to believe that he has stolen from the Kenyan Republic, what else then will be a reason to, to believe? If a 28 year on can be alleged to have walked into a bank and gotten a loan of 600 million, what else is a serious reason to believe that an economic crime has been done? Mr. Speaker, at page, just uh, shortly, Mr. Speaker, I have, I have therefore proven that the Deputy President indeed is the one who bought through coercion the estate of his late brother. The source of funds to buy the estate is not known. Also in my bundle of documents, Mr. Speaker, there is a company called Crystal, and this is a very interesting company. This company called Crystal is the one that bought Abadea Safari Hotel. And I have exhibited at page 122 of my bundle of documents a transfer document transferring the ownership of Abadea Safari Hotel from the original owners to the children of, Ms. of the Deputy President Rigadi Gashiagwa at a consideration of 535 million. And this transfer, Mr. Speaker, was done on the 22nd November 2023, immediately after the Deputy President assuming office and telling Kenyans that he found empty coffers. He was able, within two months, to buy a property worth 535 million in Nyeri. Which empty coffers did he find? The other day, I have, I have, I have, I have exhibited at page 118 the CR12 of the new company, which shows that his two sons are the directors. I have also exhibited the transfer document to show that actually the ownership of the company did shift at, an, at, a, at a cost of 535 million. And therefore, I believe I have discharged my burden of proof to the required standard. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the Deputy President said he immediately became Deputy President. He asked his children not to do business with government. But you will realize, because he's speaking from both sides of his mind, my, of mouth, you will realize that even in this transaction about hotels, Free Tops belongs to Kenya Wildlife Service. Yes, it is true, he has leased. But if you say that you, do, you have instructed your children not to transact with government, and then you lease an hotel owned by the government, are you not transacting with government? Are you not transacting with government? And therefore, the live interview by the Deputy President yesterday is a further ground for the Deputy President to be impeached. I can go on and on and on to show that the Deputy President did purchase Kuruwitu Home Resort at a cost of 250 million from the estate of his own brother. Mr. Speaker, you were told also that Vipingo Ridge, Vipingo Ridge Hotel is a, is a property within the estate of the late brother to the Deputy President. But I have exhibited in my bundle of documents, CR12. CR12 is a document that shows the company directors, showing the children of the Deputy President as directors of Vipingo, Vipingo Hotels. The children of the Deputy President are not listed in the will as executors of his estate. So one would wonder, because they are not listed as executors of the estate of the Ritu Gashagwa, then where do they come in, in terms of owning the Vipingo company? It can only be by way of purchase, it can only be by way of money laundering. Mr. Speaker, one other reason why I have provided the 20-something companies and the properties is also to demonstrate character. Some of these companies have not transacted. In, it is my prosecution theory that these are special purpose vehicles for purposes of money laundering 
and for purposes of preparation for money laundering. And therefore, one would wonder why the deputy president would have so many companies that are not active, except for the reason of waiting for a prime day for them to launder resources from government. Mr. Speaker, I have also listed many, many companies and suspicious transactions where companies were being paid as much as 100 million from the office of the deputy president. They are paid in the morning and at noon they are withdrawing the money in cash. You are aware that under our regulations, you cannot withdraw more than a million shillings from the bank. But I have listed in schedules where in a single day as many as 10 transactions, cash transactions, were being done from monies that had been paid from the office of the Deputy President. These are serious reasons to believe that the monies were being withdrawn for suspicious reasons. And for that reason, Mr. Speaker, I believe I have discharged I have discharged my burden of proof and this ground is proven beyond the required threshold and it should be confirmed as a ground of impeachment. Mr. Speaker, allow me to proceed to ground number eight. Ground number eight is about breach of section 132 of the Penal Code and breach of section 129 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Basically, these are about misleading the public. Mr. Speaker, on this one, I rely on the evidence of the video in the case of Justice Esther Minor that the Deputy President did mislead the public that Justice Esther Minor was corrupt simply because she had made a finding that that was against him. Mr. Speaker, I also rely on a video that I'm going to play shortly that the Deputy President did attack the National Intelligence Service in a televised television interview in Mombasa. Mr. Speaker, in that televised interview, and you will see it shortly, the Deputy President misled the Kenyan Republic on several accounts, which I will discuss after the video has been played. I now request the media team to play the video on NIS in Mombasa. Where did the rain begin to lead us? Where did we stop listening to the people? <laughs> President William Ruto and I were the darling of the Kenyan people by listening to them, by engaging them. And as a government, we have established institutions to ensure we not only listen to Kenyans, but also generally understand their concerns. We invest significant resources in these institutions, particularly the National Intelligence Service for this purpose. It is clear there has been a failure in the intelligence, and advice we are receiving, particularly concerning crucial government policies. The President of the Republic of Kenya today has admitted that it has come to his attention that the people of Kenya did not want anything to do with the Finance Bill 2024. The President has now agreed that we need to listen to the people. And I sympathize with my boss, President William Ruto, because this information was not available to him. I know President William Ruto. Had he known two months ago that the people of Kenya did not want anything to do with the Finance Bill 2024, he would not have asked his parliamentary party to push it through. Yet, we have an organization paid by the public to give him and government such information. And that is where the problem is. We have a dysfunctional national intelligence service that has exposed the president 
the government and the people of Kenya. Had the National Intelligence Service briefed the president two months ago about how the people of Kenya feel about the Finance Bill 2024, so many Kenyans would not have died. Property would not have been destroyed. Offices would not have been touched. There would have been no mayhem. But they slept on the job. It is hard to take people to die. Property to be destroyed. Protests across the country for the president to know the truth of what the people of Kenya feel. Yet, there is an organization paid for by the public to brief the president and the government about the feeling of the Kenyan people. With the permission, Mr. Speaker, I request Officers that we post the, the video. Service, or because Officers of the national... We have already displayed the context. Mr. Speaker, the point I'm making here is simple. Now, this is the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. By virtue of being the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, he is also a member of the National Security Council. The NIS is also in membership of the National Security Council. And therefore, the Constitution has provided fora where the Deputy President, in case he has any concerns, he can raise them within the official structures of government. Instead of doing that, he chose to be reckless, in complete disregard of the office, of the high calling of the office that he holds, the office of the Deputy President. It will be remembered that at this particular time, the country was at a security crisis, and inflammatory remarks would have led to the country disintegrating. Inflammatory remarks would have led to the social fabric of this country tearing apart. And therefore, by such doing, I am inviting the House to find that the Deputy President did mislead the public, the Deputy President did live below the expectations of the office that he holds, made unfounded sensational statements, and therefore that ground should be upheld for his impeachment. Mr. Speaker, further to that, in the oath of allegiance to office, the Deputy President swore, and I quote, to refrain from directly or indirectly revealing such matters as shall come to my knowledge in the discharge of my duties and committed to my secrecy. Mr. Speaker, as you would notice in that clip, the Deputy President says that he has been told in confidence, mark the words, I have been told in confidence by officers of the following, the following, the following. And while aware that he took an oath not to divulge information that comes to him in secrecy, he went ahead and divulged that information. I will be inviting this House to find that the Deputy President breached his own oath of allegiance to office. And a person who breaches his own oath of allegiance to office is not fit to hold the office of the Deputy President. And therefore, I urge members to find that this ground has been proven to the required standard and uphold it for impeachment. Under Ground 9, Mr. Speaker, on gross misconduct, gross misconduct has been defined as the reliction of duty in the Black's Law Dictionary. Gross misconduct has been defined as the reliction of duty and lawful or improper behavior. Mr. Speaker, we have alleged that the Deputy President did breach Article 151B of the Constitution in his utterances against the National Intelligence Service, and that is incompatible with the high calling, dignified status, and the discretion required of the office of the Deputy President. And because I had laid basis in the foregoing ground, I wish to urge members, using the same evidence that I've adduced above, to also find that ground number 10 is also proven.
ground number nine, that is. On ground number ten, gross misconduct on insubordination. We have the evidence of Masi Wanjau in the form of an affidavit that cabinet makes decisions and the deputy president defines. I have video clips in Nyanza where the president did direct. In fact, he said it is primitive for people to say that certain sections of the country cannot receive development by virtue of how they voted in the last elections. And then immediately thereafter, the deputy president repeated his shareholder Kenya government company utterances directly contradicting the president. In that arrangement, Mr. Speaker, I am submitting that that is insubordination and the evidence that we have tendered in the interest of time on record is enough to prove that ground and members should be able to approve that the Deputy President, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, has been undermining his boss, has been undermining cabinet, and therefore is guilty of the offense of gross misconduct in terms of insubordination. Mr. Speaker, I come to a very interesting last one, which is that the Deputy President has breached Article 151B and Section 34 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Mr. Speaker, in my bundle of evidence, I have the affidavit of Dr. Andrew Muller, which I would want displayed. Dr. Andrew Muller, Mr. Speaker, was the acting CEO of the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency. Kenya Medical Supplies Agency, through funding of the Global Fund, did advertise for a tender for purchase of mosquito nets to benefit Kenyans. The tender was worth about $3.7 billion. In this affidavit, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Andrew Muller avers that uh, when he came to Kemsa, and Mr. Speaker, the witness is before the House, but because this is not the trial chamber, we will not lead him in evidence, with, not, nor will he be cross-examined, but he's ready to be cross-examined when we go to Senate. He avers that when he was appointed as an acting CEO of Kemsa, and he came to office, he found the tender ongoing, and one day, the deputy president called him, threatened him, so that he could release a bid board. In his testimony, he says that the com a company that was being fronted by the deputy president, if you allow me just to get where, to where the, because this is important, at page 70 to 76, at page 70 to 76, of my band of documents, Dr. Andrew Mulwa avers that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa called me from his mobile phone. The number is provided. On my mobile phone number, the number is provided, and pressured me to surrender to his proxy, the original bid bond submitted by Sobika Impex for the above tender. He told me that he would send a proxy to collect the original bid bond. He goes further to state that Dr. Ikuno Rigadi, who is a son to Rigadi Gashagwa, the deputy president, called me and sent me a WhatsApp message from his mobile phone number, which is provided, claiming to be acting for and on the instructions of His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa. He asked for Sobika Impex Private Limited's original bid bond for the above tender, which he said His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa was trying to collect from Kemsa. Our next year two and marked AM1 are the screenshots and I would like them, they are already displayed on the screen of those messages. Doctor, he goes further to avow that Dr. Rigadi, Dr. Ikino Rigadi, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa's son, sent a one Ogora Wilson Okulo of national identity number that to collect the original bid bond submitted by Sobika Impex Limited. He concludes by saying that given the status, power, threats, 
influence of the people involved in the interference with the investigations and the cover-up of the irregularities surrounding the procurement of treated mosquito nets. I was constrained to surrender the original bid bond to Ogora Wilson Okulo. In short, members, in short, members, please listen to this. In short, I was caught in a tricky situation as there was nothing much I could do as a junior government officer against a sitting deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, this allegation is conf was admitted by none other than the deputy president yesterday live on his interview or live on television. He did confirm that, yes, he called Dr. Mulo. He also confirmed that he called him in relation to a bid bond. And he did confirm that the company called Sobika, the local representative of Sobika, is a company called Cristo. And the company called Cristo is owned by none other than the Gadi Gashago and his children. And therefore, there was a di di direct conflict of interest that the deputy president, that the representative, the, representative, the local representative of Sobika, which is an international company registered in India, is a company owned by the deputy president. And the deputy president is making a call regarding a tender to a junior government officer. I wonder how many other calls he has made. But I do not need to belabor this point because none other than the deputy president himself did admit on live television yesterday that he did make the call. It was in relation to the bid bond, and therefore I urge members to adopt the evidence of Dr. Andrew Mulra as the truthful and factual evidence, exhibiting that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa did interfere with the tendering process and also did interfere with the investigation into the same. His Excellency, the Deputy President, did inform the country falsely that uh, no money was lost. Mr. Speaker, you would know that this tender was funded under the Global Fund. And the Global Fund, through letters that we have exhibited, did cancel this funding. And therefore, the Kenyan people lost up to 5 billion Kenyan shillings in, and as well a relationship with the Global Fund, which is a major partner in our health sector. And therefore, to allege that no money was lost is false, because the Global Fund did cancel the tender, and also it affected our relationship in terms of funding from the Global Fund. And we had to do a lot of diplomatic work, going to WHO, going to Geneva, in order to restore our relationship with the Global Fund. Mr. Speaker, lastly, members, I have rushed through the grounds because of the time allocated. I have endeavored to provide evidence that all the 11 grounds that are proposed for the impeachment of His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa are merited, and there is enough evidence. The work of this chamber is to examine whether prima facie there is a case. The trial chamber in the Senate. And therefore, I want to plead with members of this House. It doesn't matter whether you sign the motion or you do not sign the motion. I have endeavored to persuade each one of you individually that this country requires a serious leadership. And His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa is not part of that, that serious leadership. I have endeavored to persuade each one of you that this country requires leaders who can respect the rule of law. This requir country requires leaders who can respect the Constitution. And His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa is not one of them. And therefore, I take this time to implore on each one of you, besides our political persuasions, to realize that we want the best for our country. This is the country that we shall bequeath to our children. And if the country is destroyed by reckless leaders like His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, there will be nothing to bequeath our future generations. And therefore, persuade each one of you, please vote with your conscience, vote with your, put Kenya first above your politics when you come to vote. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, members of parliament, if you listen carefully to His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, and I did say at the time of giving my notice of motion, I have nothing against him as a person. But I was perturbed yesterday because His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa did insult members of parliament. He insulted the intelligence of members of parliament. Yes. There are members here who are senior lawyers. 
There are members here who are senior accountants. There are members here who are teachers. There are members here who are accountants. There are members, all of us are respected in our societies. The people of Kenya have elected us to exercise a constitutional mandate in this country. But His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa did say that most of the members of parliament signed the motion without reading it. That is an insult to your intelligence. His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa, in the live interview yesterday, did say that parliament is a theatre of the absurd. In my training as a lawyer, he who insults the jury, we, he who insults the jury deserves no mercy from the jury. He who insults the jury deserves no mercy from the jury. His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa has insulted you before Kenyans. I urge you, I urge you to rise up to the occasion. I urge you to rise up to the occasion. Uphold all the 11 grounds. Uphold all the 11 grounds. Uphold all the 11 grounds. Mr. Speaker, there is evidence that I have not gone through. The whole issue of Wamunyoro investments and the land in Embakasi. I have evidence in my bundle of documents that His Excellency the Gadi Gashagwa used his office as the Deputy President, called junior officers of the Ministry of Lands, forced them to forge documents to the effect that Wamunyoro Investment had bought the land in Embakasi long even before it had been registered as a company. That land, that land, Mr. Speaker, belongs to a sickly civil servant. It belongs to a father, it belongs to a mother. Mr. Speaker, we must have a Deputy President who is compassionate. I watched the Deputy President yesterday on television displaying impunity and arrogance. He told Kenya, yes, I have said Kenya is a company, Mutadu. He said that he has said that Kenya is a company. And apologetically, he said he has said Kenya is a company. Is this the kind of a person you would want to be your Deputy President? Members of Parliament, I do not want to imagine that anything can happen to the sitting president. I do not want to imagine. But it is also a factual reality that something can happen to the president who is in power today. If anything, and God forbid, happens to the president who is in power today, is this the man you would want to complete the term as president? This man, this man, Honorable members, this man called Rigadi Gashagwa has already said that the members of parliament in Mount Kenya are either to Gunia, are either to Gunia, I don't know what that means, or are collaborators, and that he will take them home. He has already said that where I come from, we deserve no development in Ukambani. He has said that the people of Nyanza deserve no development. He has said that the people of Western deserve no development nor appointments from the government. He has said that the people of the coast deserve no development from the government. He has said that the people of Northeastern deserve no development from the government. Those are the people you represent. Those are the people you represent. As you rise up to vote, please have the best interest of your people at heart. I urge you. I urge you, honorable members, as one of your colleagues. I urge you, honorable members, as one of your colleagues. When this motion is finally put to vote, please vote to impeach Rigadi Gashagwa. Please vote to impeach Rigadi Gashagwa on all the grounds. As I conclude, Mr. Speaker, as I conclude, Mr. Speaker, the, I am confident that colleague members of parliament will approve this motion. And I want to assure you, in the event that you vote for this motion, I will also persuasively defend it before the Senate. And I am sure the Senate of the Republic of Kenya will also uphold and Kenya will have a better deputy president who views the country as a whole. 
With those remarks, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move and call our able Deputy Majority Leader, the Honorable Owen Bayer, to second the motion. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Owen Bayer, you have 10 minutes.